Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Everyday Trader. Uh, this is one of your hosts, Eric Hale from Trader Oasis, and joined with me today is my partner, Greg Jensen. Good to be here. Good to be here, folks. Hopefully, uh, today's January 6th will be a little less eventful than last year's, or two years ago, January 6th. Oh, boy, it's January 6th. And yeah. we don't have a Speaker of the House. How about that? How many we votes? don't. Let's, was it, was wow, it 12 we, votes yesterday? We got to restart. That is a horrible thing. Talk about politics already. I'm just kidding. Let's, we'll keep going. Oh, no, no. Well, I'd say one of the things that's really good for Americans, um, I saw Justin Amash speak once uh, uh, back in December, and um, he pointed out that there's been a change that's happened in Congress um, uh, where um, all amendments to any bills have to go through the Rules Committee, which is headed by the Speaker of the House. So it has actually changed under Ryan, and Nancy Pelosi certainly loved it as well, because the Speaker of the House chairs that committee. Um, and if you go back and you look at amendments that have gone through in the past six years, the past three um, terms, really, for Congress, there hasn't been any amendments, any substantial amendments that have made it through because the Rules Committee can thumbs up, thumbs down, whatever makes it to the floor. Basically, it gives no power to your congressman. And that was one of the things that that actually has made it through here is that there's you know five representatives that has said we have to undo that rule. Uh, so you might have heard that this change that gives power to rank and file members, that's a good thing for Americans. So our, yeah, uh, I agree. I have to yeah, agree. Our, our elected um, representatives can can get back to doing legislative as opposed to everything just going with the party. So I I, I know we were we I don't want to be political, but <laughs> I actually think that's a really good thing, uh, too. From a market standpoint, it probably means that there's going to be uh, more difficulty in passing legislation if that if that uh, that change in the rules for the House sticks. Unfortunately, that's I think good debate is you know good for democracy, and um, but it also means it's tougher to pass legislation, which tends to be good for the market. Yeah. So we are seeing some interesting stuff in the market today. We've got a pretty positive day happening um like to get your thoughts on that greg well the interesting part was this earlier this week the markets have been uh, it's been the good news is bad news for the market good news for the economy bad news for the market and we saw that yesterday with the adp jobs report it it was forecasting us or it was reporting from their standpoint a very strong report on uh, employment in the private payroll. That's what the ADP report is. Today, of course, we've got the non-farm payroll number, which also beat expectation. And so if that trend were following suit, you know, good news for the economy has been bad news for the market. And that, of course, because that means the Federal Reserve is going to continue to raise rates for longer. Well, today we actually got some mixed data, actually, even though on the headline number, that non-farm payroll number was really solid. We, you know, beat by 223, or we added 223. We didn't beat by 223. Then it'd be, then maybe we would be going down. That would be a massive beat. But 223 jobs, thousand jobs were added in December. Unemployment rate went down. If you dig into some of the data a little further, though, the the labor force participation rate went up, which is a good thing. Um, the other thing that was actually revised lower was the average hourly earnings from December's report. Um, mm. And that's actually probably the biggest risk, I think, for the Fed to continue going forward is uh, was the wage pressure. And if wage pressure isn't as bad, well, then maybe the Fed is doing what they were hoping to do. They're slowing down the pressure that's being caused by inflation. Uh, now that's not the only piece of data. And I actually think, well, before we move off of jobs, you're you're confusing me, Greg, can you, can you explain to me, was this a good report or a bad report? I'm confused about what's good and what's bad. (laughs) So it's, it it is good. I mean, 223,000 jobs. But is that bad or is good, bad or bad as good as good? (laughs) No, that's good. And if it were just that number, then I think the market may have taken it bad, but there was some more data as you dig down, I think it was particularly the revised, the revision of last month's average hourly earnings. Because if you think about it, we want full employment. Sure. What we don't want from an inflationary standpoint is we don't want people making, you know, 
$25 an hour today. And in next week or next month, they're making $28 an hour. And the following month, they're making $32 an hour. That's the wage pressure that would really make inflation spiral to the upside. And so the fact that we saw last month's actually wage number, even though everyone's still employed, everyone's wages aren't massively going up. And so I think it kind of, it, let me put it this way. I don't necessarily think it made it a bad report. It just took the edge off of it being too good of a report. <laughs> Does uh, that sound okay? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, so, I mean, if I was, I'm joking with Greg because um, just earlier in this week, good, you know, good reports have been the market's response negatively because ostensibly the market is is believing that the Fed is going to be more aggressive in terms of its rate hikes. And that's the really that's been the story driving the markets has been what is the Fed going to do? And you had a good blog yesterday talking about, you know, don't fight the Fed. And so this is what we're looking at is trying to interpret um, the data as it comes in. And, and is this going to be good for, um, you know, is it, I was joking because, you know, this, I think this is a really solid employment uh, report and it did beat expectations. I mean, we had unemployment uh, went down. Uh, I think the forecast was for 3.7. It was expected to go up a little bit. Um, so a, another solid indication which I do think makes it harder, but the wages and the participation rate, uh, on the other hand, um, are helpful as well. Uh, but I think there's more than that. I think you know if we looked at the market today, this is a this is a five day intraday chart, um, and, and we could see what happened this morning is so very bullish, and then kind of a little bit of a dip, and then we turn back around again. We actually had two critical reports that came out today, and I don't think they're both getting. Uh, the attention that they deserve. Uh, one, of course, is the jobs report. We just talked about that. Um, so um, Nick Timoros, of course, the, the real speaker of the Fed, <laughs> uh, did um, post a piece um, and saying it's not really clear whether we're going to go to 50 or, or 25 or 50. I, I know you're not a big fan of uh, the CME uh are, are are you a fan of this or not? I, I don't, I'm, I'm not. I think it's too easily manipulated. Just like the VIX is too easy easily manipulated. Mm -hmm. It's well, traded. It's so, so yeah. what we're talking about is this. Uh, so the Chicago Mercantile Exchange trades futures on the Fed rates, Fed funds rate, which isn't loading for me right now. So hopefully it's not my internet. Uh, oh, there we go. So um, this gives a probability based on on actual people buying these futures. Yeah, it's not loading. Um, it's not your internet. I hear you fine. Okay, good. So anyways, we uh, this number gets watched closely by a lot of people to say, okay, so when something happens in the news, I usually go here and say, was this good or bad? Did it impact the Fed? And yeah, so so actually, what, so based on today, so our current uh, rate um, is 425 to 450. That's the Fed funds rate today. This is looking at the February meeting. So based on today's data, we we can we can make the presumption, and this will change throughout the day. This is you know okay, it's ten oh eight east uh, central time right now, eleven oh eight eastern time, and we're showing a seventy seven point two percent probability that the there's a twenty five point basis hike. That's what this is four fifty to four seventy five is a uh, twenty five basis point. There's so there's zero probability of no rate hike. So there, we're pricing in the question is, is it 25 or is it 50? Based on the data today, um, according to the CME, it went down. And I, you're probably right. Watching this too much can be uh, can be a problem. Um, that that it, And things like this, especially like you mentioned with the VIX, I think the VIX lost a lot of its power when it became an instrument that you could trade derivatives on the VIX. You can't trade the VIX. There are no options on the VIX. You can't buy and sell the VIX, but you can sell uh, options on futures and, and futures. And so the, since they started doing that, it changed the VIX. I mean, for me, it's a, one of those philosophical things is if there's a, a tree in the forest, does it make a sound? And when the observer went, for me, it's a, the, the philosophical thing is when you trade an index, it changes the index. So you're right. The CME thing, this, this does probably get manipulated and jacked around a little bit. So we got to be careful with it. 
But I think on the surface, you can say that the summary of the news today is that the Fed is less likely, I would take away less likely for a 50 basis point hike, maybe pointing more towards a 25. I think that's fair. And I think the interesting thing was this week, it's uh, um, the the Fed governor that they rolled out, or I guess he's not a governor, he's president of the Minneapolis Fed, Neil Kashkari was, was who the Fed rolled out this week to say, you know, we're going to be higher for longer. You know, in the past, it's been Bullard, right? Bullard has been the guy that's been the guy that's come out and he's been the hawk. And it was it was flipped this week in that Bullard's comments actually, I think, eased the market a little bit um, because he made the comment of he feels like we're not in a restrictive zone yet for inflation, but we're getting close. And for Bullard to say we're getting close, that's actually optimistic that maybe the Fed feels like they are accomplishing. And maybe they saw this ISM data that came out today um, that, that I think is what really has sparked this rally in the market today because right. the that's, ISM data was not. That's where I was going to go next is that people weren't, aren't really talking about that. I did want to touch on the Fed. Just, just you and I both know, because we've heard it uh, firsthand from, um, from FOMC member members um, that the Fed, I think, is doing a much better job at staying coordinated in its messaging. I think that they've realized that when they're um, each out there expressing their opinions, which they're welcome to do, um, that it can have significant impacts on the market. And this we've really seen this massive evolution that's happened since Greenspan on communicating uh, the Fed communicating. It used to just be a black box and we didn't know. And there's some interesting history that's happened in the past that we're finding out, um, you know, these, some of these old Fed meeting minutes from 20 years ago, um, what they knew and what they didn't know. But uh, I think the Fed is very deliberate in terms of its communication, and there's um, there is room for dissent and for people to have opinions. Like Lael Brainerd tends to be on the opposite end of the spectrum, but I I do think that they you know that they I don't think I know that Jay says hey let's all be clear on how we you're welcome to express your opinions, but let's not surprise anybody. So let's make sure everybody knows what everybody's going to say. And I think that, you know, seeing Neil Kashkari going from being who's typically a dove to something a little bit more hawkish, I don't think that's an accident. I think that that's there. And it's not like there's some sort of ma manipulation or control. I just think it's evidence of them trying to be clear and explicit in communicating your thoughts on that? I, I agree that that's a good thing that the Fed is doing. Um, I, the market doesn't like uncertainty. And the biggest thing that's been driving the market really since 2008 it has been the Fed and the Fed's monetary policy. I mean, I brought up in the, the daily market update I did for, op, for the options animal student base uh, earlier this week. I brought up a chart comparing since 2008, comparing the Fed's balance sheet to a chart of the S&P and their mirrors of one another. Um, you know, the, the Fed's balance sheet is what drives monetary markets. Um, it doesn't necessarily drive inflation per se. I think that's, they can control inflation. Inflation could also be impacted by uh, treasury spending too, not just Fed spending. The difference, of course, Fed is the Federal Reserve. Treasury is what we do with our tax dollars uh, over at over in Washington D.C. I know sometimes people have a hard time differentiating those two, so I just wanted to clarify that 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 the Fed is doing a better job, I think, of communicating and helping eliminate some of that uncertainty that the market feels. So yeah, yeah. I think it's good. Yeah, and there is uh, there's definitely coordination that you can see between even the Treasury and the uh, the FOMC, which is not the sort of stuff we've seen really in the past. I, I, mean, I think you know I haven't just I haven't historically studied to see if this is unprecedented or not. But in my lifetime of trading, this is the first time that a former president of the Federal Reserve, you know, the president of board of directors, you know in Janet Yellen is the U.S. Treasury Secretary. Now, that may, historically, that may have existed in the past, I'm not sure, but that is, I think, from a communication standpoint, probably helping 
uh, coordinate that as well, because Janet has been friends with most of the Federal Reserve board members for years. In fact, some of them were part of the board when she was the chairman of the board. Right. Um, so, yeah, so there is uh, coordination going on there for sure. Um, but I, what we wanted to talk about, we talked about jobs report. And I think that's getting a lot of the attention, a lot of the headlines. But um, another economic report that came out today that's very significant and not getting a lot of attention, or not getting as much attention, I don't think, as the jobs report. And this is the ISM report, Mohammed Al Arian, which I think is, golly, one of the smartest people out there when it comes to economics and his um, his insights are always really appreciated. I think he's a must follow for anybody. Um, but he talks about how this I, ISM report, um, we fell very, very low, lowest since May 2020. Um, jumping over to uh, advisor perspectives uh, to see the graph on this, this is pretty shocking to see this chart here of where ISM, and this is a long term chart, it's going back to 2008. So ISM below 50 is considered um, contracting. So we're um, the indication of a potential recession that manufacturing slowing down. We can see historically uh, the red dot is the average over this period of time. And we can see these different reports that happen. You know, here's the COVID crisis. Here's the crash that happened back in, you know, the global financial crisis. And so we've got another negative number. This is a really significant report. And this is the example of bad news is good news. I do think that this is by and large the reason why we're seeing um, the response in the CME Fed dropping down to 25 basis point, because I think the Fed is going to look at this data and say, okay, things are contracting, our uh, our tightening policy is working. Even though the jobs number is a little bit better, this is this is a very significant number in my point, my opinion. Greg? I, I think I agree. I think this is what they've been trying to do. And now I think comes the challenging part. If they truly have turned the Titanic and now, or maybe the Titanic's the wrong word because that's a boat. We're talking about now a landing. Now are they going to be able to generate the soft landing or the hard landing? If they've started to slow the economy, now can they make it so that we can just kind of slide lower in, in these economic numbers, the ISM being one of them versus a hard landing? Uh, which would insinuate that the Fed has done too much. And now we're going to start to see a big contraction. The market today feels like they're accomplishing the soft landing. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe not. I have to say sometimes on days like today, uh, particularly when we knew there was going to be a jobs report, uh, there was probably a lot of people ready to trade today. Um, and if nothing else, trade those ever increasingly popular 24 hours till expiration options that seem to be dominating the options market right now, especially in the overall ETF world and the, the, um, the cash futures on the S and P contracts, those uh, insane amount of volume on those on a daily basis right now, today might just be, a, Hey, we got good data. The market momentum's bullish. Let's rally. And so that's what you're seeing today. I, I hope we can pull off this soft landing. I still mentioned my skepticism about it, but I hope we can. I mean, if the jobs market stays strong throughout this and we can get the economy to slow down and inflation to come down, they can pull it off. Let's hope. Uh, yeah. I, I, you know, I've been in the camp of a soft landing and that's, um, I, I, I'm, and I'm, this is, I'm not smart enough to, I follow the other smart people. 65% of all um, blue chip econo economists are forecasting a recession next year. Um, the, the, the big outlier it has been Goldman Sachs, who definitely carries a lot of weight and they have some of the smartest people in the industry. They've, they've got the outlook at 35%. Of a, of a recession in 2023. In fact, they actually forecast that we're going to have a very strong economy. Some of their data is showing that the effects of um, the Fed's policy, one of, one of the things that people have been saying, including me, is that there's a lag effect. When the Fed tightens, it takes a while for that effect to work through. And they published a report at the end of December showing that um, 
that the effect actually has been much quicker. And we've seen the extent of um, the Fed policy playing out already, indicating that if, if there's no more lag, the, the economy is going to continue to strengthen and the Fed's going to actually go much higher than anybody thinks it's going to go. That's that's kind of their position, which so it's not a, a slam dunk that the market's going to go higher. If the economy gets better and the Fed is tighter, I think we can have a strong economy and have a weaker market. That's yeah. sort of what's spelling out there. So it changes things. Um, really interesting looking forward for 2023 because it really makes it a stock picker's market. Because before you buy anything, everything goes up. You know, mark, you know, market goes, right? Everything goes up. Buy everything, the whole market goes up. And I think we're seeing a transition back to what I consider a normal market where fundamentals matter and some sectors are going to do better and some sectors are going to do poor. And Absolutely. so this is this is where it matters. It's not just buy everything. It's it's let's try to pick some names. Okay, Although there are some Matt, go on. Oh, I was gonna say I was gonna throw you a curveball. I know we got to wrap up soon, but um let's rather than talking macro picture, let's jump to individual stock stuff right now. Then what's what are two what what's surprising to you today? If if you had to go buy buy something today, what are you looking at? Well. I do want to cover just one other sort of big picture thing. All right. And, and this is for, for people to look at. And we'll talk about that because I do have a stock name, which we'll, we'll get to. It won't be a surprise to people, I don't think. It won't be a surprise to you, certainly. But what I wanted to talk about is my favorite book, which I, I love the Stock Traders Almanac. So um, I I heard somebody say, actually, I think it was Barry Ritholtz says, I think he said, I think it was Barry. Somebody said, Everybody on Wall Street has this on their desk. And actually, it might have been an interview with uh, with one of the Hirsches. So this is Joel Hirsch. It's the Hirsch and Hirsch, Hirsch father and son that put this out. I'm sorry, Jeff Hirsch. Um, his father's retired now. It's Chris Mistel that does it with him. But those um, there's some things that happen with respect to a calendar that happen every year um, with some some uncanny sort of correlations. And the one that everybody talks about was and the most recent one is the Santa Claus rally. And it didn't feel like we had a Santa Claus rally. And people are misattributing, uh, you know, throughout December, I heard people saying, oh, no Santa Claus, no Santa Claus. Do we have Santa Claus? Let's be clear. The definition of the Santa Claus rally is the last five trading days of the year, first two trading days of the next year. So seven days, seven trading days. And we had for the seventh year in a row, a Santa Claus rally. If you consider the last two days that we had of the year, uh, it's the seventh year in a row that we've had those seven days have been net up. So when you have that sort of a trend, those those things need to be paid attention to. The next one that's out there is this uh, January's first five days. There's also a thing called the January effect where you look at the whole month of January, but the January first five days, and let me read just a, a little bit of this, the last 47 up First five days were followed by full five-year gains 39 times, 83% of the time that is, for an average of a 14% gain over the year. So as the first week in January goes, 83% of the time in history, the, the market has gone up. And we've had a few exceptions, and those tend to be when there's wars. So there, there is geopolitical risk that's out there, but the Stock Traders Almanac uh, is a is a is a must buy. They don't give this stuff away for free. Let's, you know, spend twenty five bucks and buy the book, um, or you can pay for membership to get it online. I do think this is worth looking at because you just I'm, I, you, you got to pay attention to something that has an eighty three percent accuracy or something that happens seven years in a row. Um, not that we're short-term day traders or, or swing traders that are trying to take advantage of this, but in terms of making decisions, you know, maybe I should hold off or wait till something's clear and it's data that you, you need to use. So I just wanted to share that and put a plug in for this, this book. No connection to, uh, to, to the Stock Traders Almanac or Jeff Hirsch, but I think he does a great job. So before today, if that were the case, you know, we still have, we're, this is only day four. So we'll right. get Monday to include in that as well. Before today, we were down for the right. week, for the first five days. We yeah. were actually flipped positive. We're up about 30 points on the S&P right now for that first five trading days. Um, we'll see how today finishes out and how Monday does, if that uh, holds true. It's so I, I've seen that hold true, too, to be honest. I mean, I've been trading a long time. 
I've seen this weird January effect happen. Like you said, 80% of the time, it's right. You know, I, I really want to understand the reason why behind these sort of things. I just, um, I, and, it, and it, there, there needs to be some narrative that explains why it can't just be random. I mean, you and I know that you can, you, you shouldn't roll 12 that often on, on the dice. It shouldn't come up that often, but we've seen people do it three times in a row. So, okay, maybe I should put hard sixes. Uh, you know, but when you see it happen three times in a row, that shouldn't happen very often. Um, so that's probably luck, but uh, seeing what's going on in the market and we here's looking back five days and it looks like we could, um, you know, we could finish where we go Monday um, positively. Not that that means I'm going to bias everything bullishly for it, but it's the sort of thing that makes you go. Hmm. Yeah. We'll see. So switching gears to you. What am I watching? And and I, you know what I'm watching. <laughs> I do. <laughs> so Maybe. Tesla has been uh, a very prominent um, in our, as somebody made a contest, are you guys a Tesla podcast? <laughs> we are not Tesla podcast. We talk about more than Tesla, but it certainly has got a lot going on. And what's happening right now, of course, um, a lot of news this week. So earlier in the week, production was um, below. They were only up 40% year over year. <laughs> only 40%. Like what? Like that's fantastic uh, on an annualized rate. It's just insane. And there's some stuff going on in China right now uh, where they've uh, just massively sliced on some of the models as much as a 14% discount on some of the Chinese models. So I think the market took that as, as negative um, and big move down and we've recovered a little bit here. I actually have a spread trade that I'm going to, I want to walk through to show people why cash secured puts and naked puts I think are dumb trades. I, I think that people are taking way too much risk and you can spread trade and and be able to get exactly the same results, not not even the same results, better results. So if you look so, in terms of risk versus capital, much lower risk, much higher return on risk, even potentially higher probabilities of making money. Um, it's what we teach is the core of what we teach. And I think people who, some people who've been in, uh, um, it, it, like I did a trade when the stock was around 180 uh, using a put spread. And uh, if I was doing a naked put, I would be down about 8,000 bucks in the trade right now. Instead, the trade's down $337. And I have a real good probability of adjusting that trade to make it, make it profitable. So it's um, understanding spread trading is really important. I, I promise I'll do it in the next few days and put that out as a, a separate short video. It's an actual case study using real examples, you know, my real money to show people what I'm talking about here. I got to throw in two cents on Tesla as well. I've got a different stock I'm looking at. Um, they, they only missed their deliveries number by what? Like three or 4%. It was a pretty small number. Yet mm -hmm. the stock's down what? 50% since Thanksgiving alone. I mean, it's overdone. Tesla's, in my opinion, a, is a screaming buy right now. Uh, could it go lower when it's a screaming buy? It always can. You never know 100%. And it goes to your point. Would you just go buy the stock or would you would you do a collar trade? No, i do a spread trade. Exactly what you're saying and what you'll define in another video. Because well, so yeah, yeah, be so careful. You say more. screaming buy, people are going to go out and YOLO and just. Yeah. yeah. So the go, other stock. Go buy short-term long calls or something. I don't know. The, the other Just stock bad, I'm looking at this bet. week. Go on, go on. All right, all right. The, my stock I'm looking at right now is actually Apple. Um, Apple, I think, had a pretty significant week. We made it through. They set their earnings date this week. Normally, if they're going to warn on earnings, which I know that's been some of the concern. There's been some rumblings out there that Apple's Q4 numbers are not going to be very good. Um they, they've had suppliers, you know, tell people to slow things down on production like AirPods and uh, different wearables on watches that they have. Uh, they didn't say that about the phone, by the way. Um, I think if they were going to warn on earnings, they would have warned this week. Instead, what they did is they solidified their earnings date is set for February 2nd. Um, I think this might be one of those situations where you could actually start to see Apple rally in anticipation of earnings um, over the next few weeks. If it doesn't, I think it could create a great earnings trade as well. Um, 
to take advantage of an explosive move with earnings. Because I think fundamentally, to me, that's a good sign that they got through, they announced, they set their earnings date in stone, and there was no warning from the company this week when they normally would have issued some type of forecast trying to, uh, if they were expecting a bad quarter, they were trying to be softening it right now with different PR moves. And they're not. I think we're going to see a good quarter out of Apple. So let me let me let me pin you down a little bit here. So explosive move um, it, that I think a lot of option traders would think, oh, buy a straddle or a strangle. What what's your thoughts on that? I'd rather do some type of spread that pays for a straddle if you can. Uh, you could do an explosive collar right here and on the underline. You right. could do an explosive bull put, um, an exploding bull put where you have a credit spread that takes advantage of a directional move, whether you want it to be a bullish or a bearish leaning, you choose the call or put, but use a credit spread to pay for it. So um, so let me, let me interpret for some people what, what you just described, and that is the difference between a Vega positive and a Vega negative trade. And Greg didn't say it, but that's the reason why he's, he, he identified those trades immediately. I said, okay, I know that what he's talking about. Those are Vega negative trades. What that means is when implied volatility goes down, which is exactly what tends to happen with earnings. We see, an, we see implied volatility rise going into the earnings event, and then we see a massive drop. And people who buy straddles and straggles usually lose money on earnings it's uh, over time at goldman sachs did a study um, of straddles and strangles looking at fourteen thousand earnings events and uh, it showed that that was one of the worst strategies people can do over earnings is buying straddles or strangles so yes the stock is explosive but it's already priced into the options and this it tends to be exacerbated when a stock is down so implied volatility is not bullish or bearish but when a stock goes down implied volatility tends to go up and so i think the options are very expensive right now I think it'd be really tough um, to make money on a straddle or strangle. I think you need to look at some other sort of strategy that would that would benefit from not only explosive move in the equity, but also a drop in implied volatility. Do you agree? Yeah, that I, I know. I hundred percent agree. And I actually think, it, to, you know, you, I know this may sound old school coming from an options trader. Buying the equity right here is not a bad thing, and using a collar trade to get through the earnings event in a month or so. Maybe even just buying a a even just a long call i know options might be expensive they're going to be more expensive on the put side than on the call side right now well that's I, I, one of the things i've known with you and and i don't know how you do it but you're uncanny in being able to play long options on apple i've seen you do it for well over a decade so uh I, i'm fascinated i'm not as good at it as you you have a, a kind of a sixth sense there but listen i'm waiting for my next meeting I think as long as we don't get some type of overriding bearish momentum in the overall market, I think Apple's a stock I like right here. I think same thing with Tesla. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. Well, well, it's well, great talking to you. To we one. always find plenty to talk about here. I think we say, oh, we're going to keep this one short and then we get good content. So yeah. hopefully this was you know uh, interesting for you folks and hopefully it's timely. So Please, please continue to provide your feedback, like and share. Uh, if you can share this with your friends, post it on your social media account, say, hey, check these guys out. Um, or And don't forget to comment and subscribe. Is that it? Anything to wrap things up? No, that's it for me. Thanks, Eric. All right. Good to talk to you. All right. We'll talk to you all hey, soon. Bye. Thanks, everybody.